Um, okay, we're now going to get into the business uh, end after those wonderful uh, keynote uh, speeches. I'm going to hand over to uh, Jack Morris now, who's going to kick off the first panel focusing on transition plans and transition planning. Jack, as you probably know, is head of policy at CGFI and also leads the secretariat for the uh, transition plan task force uh, with CGFI and E3G. Jack, over to you. Thanks very much, Ryan. Um, and thank you uh, to the minister, to, to Ian, to Ben. Um, I think there's two really key themes that are really coming out for me which help us with the transition plan discussion, which is that theme around transparency um, and also the, the usability of data to take action. And I think that's really what we're, we're here to talk about. Um, so I'm really pleased to have such a fantastic panel with me. Um, so we have Dr. Svenja Siminski, who is Managing Director of Climate and Sustainability at Marsh McLennan and Professor in Practice at the GRI, and also sits on the CCC's Adaptation Committee. We have Tim Rawlings, who's co-head of the Climate Hub at the Bank of England, Jennifer Bell, Vice President of Climate Change at Barclays, and Matt Scott, who is Senior Director of the Climate and Resilience Hub at WTW. Um, so, just a bit of context. We've heard a bit about the TPT so far. Transition plans are really here to help us as forward-looking strategic documents going beyond simple disclosure, but therefore for really um, informing capital allocation and crucially supporting the transition in the real economy. Um, so providing that data that's crucial for investors and many other stakeholders to make uh, better decisions. So we know at COP26 um, this was initially launched. COP feels like a very long time ago now. <laughs> We're all starting to think about COP28. Um, but the really key thing here is that throughout the plethora of net zero commitments, transition plans really help us to understand what's underneath the hood and how companies and financial firms are taking forward action. So we've heard a little bit about the Transition Plan Task Force final um, framework coming out a bit later this year and how it's going to inform future regulation and legislation in the UK. Um, Matt, I'd like to start with you, please, and just... If you could tell us a little bit um, through your own work on the TPT, what are the key recommendations really and, and why is it important? Sure, uh, thank you Jack and uh, great to be here. So alongside my role at WTW, I help to co-chair Workstream 1 of the delivery group of the Transition Plan Task Force along with Chris Stark from the Committee on Climate Change. Um, uh, I also uh, got to lead the, the first green finance strategy actually when the, the CGFI and even GFI are that Point with just words on the page. So it's, uh, it's really, really exciting to see so many people here and see the UK continue to cement uh, its leadership in green finance. And I think TPT, in a way, I think brings many of the learnings and insights that we've had over the last 10 years or so together into a, into a common framework. So one of the things that we heard quite consistently as we were thinking through transition plan disclosures was the need to to develop a framework and an approach that would drive the right behaviours to really address climate risk, both at the level of individual firms, as well as the future risk that we face uh, and the systemic issue that we're all, all here to address, um, and do that in a way that, um, again, can drive the right behaviours rather than perhaps falling into something that focuses more on, on just complying with climate disclosure. Um, and as we did that, some of the, the feedback that we were getting from the market and also from, from regulators, including uh, Tim's colleague uh, Sarah Breeden at the bank, were some of the unintended consequences that could happen uh, and could result from just a very narrow focus on meeting portfolio targets, uh, and in particular this sort of notion of paper decarbonisation that we could uh, end up in a situation where firms are spending a lot of time managing their reputation to meet their portfolio targets, but that might not necessarily be leading to a whole economy transition. So therefore, the TPT recommendations are really positioned around this notion of a strategic and rounded approach to transition planning that really recognises that when firms are thinking about planning for the transition, particularly financial institutions, there's really three elements that they need to consider. So the first one um, actually take, takes us way back, Sven, to some of the work we did together at the Bank of England almost 10 years ago, and that's you know, the integration of climate-related financial risks. Um, so physical transition liability risks, obviously the whole intention of that, of TCFT, was to try and get better disclosure around those financial risks. 
And I think what we're learning is that a carbon footprint of a portfolio doesn't necessarily translate to the financial risks and opportunities that result from the transition. So there's many firms that could be quite high carbon, but well positioned. So take, for example, mining lithium, mining copper, you know, quite high carbon intensive activities, but actually quite financially well positioned for the transition. Take the service sector company. Service sector companies tend to be low carbon in their emissions, but if you're serving the oil and gas sector, you're probably quite exposed to transition risk still. So, so firstly, getting the clarity that you know, an important aspect of the transition is integrating climate-related financial risks and opportunities, as Rowan mentioned, you know, turning physics into finance. I guess the second element being the needs on the back of net zero targets to be focusing on decarbonisation and therefore progressing towards uh, net zero targets. Um, and obviously that's really important that we get the right disclosures around that entity level decarbonisation. But then to pick up what Jack said in his opening remarks, the third element being a focus on an economy-wide decarbonisation. So what are the levers and capabilities that the financial sector has to help the whole economy to transition? Because obviously it will be global emissions that determine the future risks that we face, not necessarily the level of emissions in any single portfolio. So I guess that speaks to disclosure around things like financing climate solutions, around engagement, and around some of the other things that the financial sector can do to become a steward of a whole economy transition. And that's really the essence of what we wanted to lay out really as part of this strategic and rounded approach. Again, to, to just highlight the fact that transition planning is, is focused and uh, is important to be looking through the net zero lens of your own emissions, but it's also broader than that, so we can make sure that we have a whole economy transition. Um, and maybe I'll stop there as an as initial framing of, of, uh, of where we've landed and our landing as, as part of the TPT. Brilliant, thank you, Matt. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's so much in there. Please catch Matt, you know, in the coffee break because the, you know the framework is so large and and um, there's lots to talk about. So. Jen, if we could turn to Barclays' experience here. So could you set out a bit about why transition plans are important for financial institutions, both from using a plan to preparing one? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for having me on this panel as well today. So as a preparer of a transition plan, I think we've already heard about the, the really valuable level of detail that goes into it, the wealth of information that you have to put into a plan and how valuable those can be both as a preparer when you're going through that process, but also putting that out for your stakeholders to, to use that information. I really see a sort of step change in thinking that a transition pl plan drives when you, you, when you go through the process of preparing one. When I was at the Bank of England several years ago, I was working on the bank's first TCFD report. I saw the just step change that that kind of process can, can have in an organisation, and I really see the same thing happening now, potentially even to a greater degree in transition planning as you're thinking about forward-looking issues and really getting, as you said, Jack, under the hood of just a target that, that at a high level is quite simplistic. But maybe if I focus a bit more on a user, us being a user of transition plans, financial institutions own transition is really a reflection of its, their clients' transitions. And so we are really, really interested in what our clients are saying in their transition plans so that we can make the best assessment of our own uh, risks and opportunities for the transition. Specifically at Barclays, we evaluate our clients' transition plans for all the clients in sectors that we've set targets for. We do this through our client transition framework, where we look across anything they've put out in disclosures, but transition plans definitely seem to be at the top of providing the most useful information. We look at quantitative metrics, so their, their emission targets, but also their current emissions and their historical emissions, trying to get a sense of you know, where are they now, where are they going, but where have they come from to get a sense of what really is their pathway. But importantly, it's the qualitative things that add the colour to the, uh, the discussion. And that's where transition plans really come in because the framework that the TBT has set out really sets out so many different metrics that we like to look at um, in our clients' uh, transition. So things like governance, what are they doing in terms of the executive compensation being linked to targets? Are there, is the board approving the plan? But also really tangible sort of on the ground metrics, things like are they using the low carbon technology that they need to be using in that sector if they're going to get to net zero? Are they backing up their transition plan or their targets um, with 
clear green capex and opex because that is when you know this is actually going to get delivered and, and those sorts of things mirror with the ambition of a target but give the credibility um, underneath it and we take all this information together and we try and bucket our clients into sort of one to five buckets to give us a sense of who's in line with net zero and in line with our own targets um, that we have for that sector and who's at most at risk of falling behind. And those buckets are really useful internally, but if I maybe pick out two uh, stats that maybe help to demonstrate the point of why it's important to go beyond just targets. We found through our reviews last year, 80% of the clients that we review had a climate target. 80%, great. Of those clients we reviewed, 60% had tied the achievement of their targets to executive compensation. And that gap shows you maybe there is a little bit more colour that you need in just taking that target on its own because it shows potentially, and that's just a very simplistic way of looking at it, but potentially there are some clients that are really pushing their, their targets and are really going to deliver and maybe some that we might want to take a closer look at. And things like the Transition Plan Task Force Framework, developing really robust transition plans is going to help us to get the information that we need because one thing we did find is that there is definitely a lack of detailed information out there that we, we want to see, but we're just not seeing to the level of granularity and it definitely not the comparability that we would like. And, and one key thing is that green capex, opex stat that I, I raised earlier. That's something that def definitely there's still way to go on that. And as we see the transition plans improving on our clients, it's great news for us because we can make even more use of them. When we see where our clients are falling in those five buckets, we can start to integrate into things like capital allocation decisions, into our engagement, prioritization, and ultimately we can go back round to the loop of our preparing our own transition plan and pick out things like where are our key dependencies, where are our key levers that we can pull to really help drive the transition. So I see the two, user and preparer, are really fundamental, but uh, yeah, we're, we're very much looking forward to the scaling up and the improvement in transition plans that will come as the TPT's framework's embedded across the real economy. Thanks, Jen. Um, there's some really startling stats there that just give us an indication. Um, and I, I suppose what we're seeing is really, you know, future regulation might well come in, um, but we also have this downward pressure through the value chain and the expectations that are already coming in there um, on clients. Um, so, Svenja, can I turn to you a little bit? Um, given the professional services focus of Marsh McLennan, what are the uses for transition plans across the financial sector, perhaps going beyond a little bit um, what Jen set out there, um, and where are your, your own clients on this journey? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, and I have to start by saying congratulations to CGFI, and I say this bit um, tongue-in-cheek because a couple of years ago, I was running the competing bit at LSE with a few partners, and, you know, I have to admit, you know, at that time, I was gutted. Um, when this consortium won, but you know, seeing what actually happened since, and also being part of this event here, you know, there are no hard feelings. So congratulations, <laughs> um, and you know, very excited because I think what also what my role at Marsh McLennan um, sort of tries to capture is really this translation element between you know science, between the commercial sec commercial activities and also policy and regulation. And I've been doing this throughout my career, but I think when it comes to transition planning, ultimately, if you don't really engage in all three, then you know, you're gonna hit some roadblocks. Um, so what we do at Marsh McLennan, so we, we, I work across, I sit at the group level, and we have four companies, Marsh, an insurance broker, Guy Carpenter, reinsurance broker, Mercer, asset manager, and Oliver Wyman, a risk consultancy firm. So what we do is, you know, we ha basically help make organizations more successful and the transition is a part of that. And what I really enjoy is that it forces me also to step out of the echo chamber. And that's something I, I would like to, to leave all of you with. I mean, it's great to work, you know, in the science community, with the leaders and sort of developing really cutting edge solutions. And I think, you know, that is obviously really necessary. But it's also really important to step out of that echo chamber and engage with those who are really at the beginning of the journey. And for a lot of companies, you know, transition plans are scary. 
Let's just put it that way. I mean, they are really complex and they are scary. It's not rocket science, but it is complex. And I think what's been interesting over the last maybe two years, you know, I think the first part was the ambition. And I think a lot of companies have sort of embraced that and have set, set out what the ambition is. And now it's obviously the challenge of translating that into, into action and making, you know, those targets something, you know, real and, and influencing decisions based on your targets. And I think this is what well, we, we've framed the term saying commercially smart transition, because I think you have to recognize that the transition also needs to happen while, you know, businesses operate you know, have, having to deal with a lot of other challenges. If we just look back last year, you know, the, this term doing the transition during a poly crisis, you know, we've seen what we often call the energy trilemma of your know, energy costs, energy security, and then sustainability. And I think all of that, you know, we, we need to recognize that um, when we look at transition plans. And that doesn't mean that we, that should taper down our ambition. No, far from it. But I think it's a useful reality check. And I think it sort of puts the onus on, you know, on the science community, also on, on policymakers and also on, on services firms to, to help, to do a lot of hand holding and to show what is feasible and to use, you know, positive examples. And you know, fortunately there are lots of positive examples because that's what I find inspiring. I mean I I meet a lot of clients, a lot of companies across different sectors who who really starting, you know, to sort of not just look through this in terms of emission, accounting for emission, but they're starting to ask, okay, well, what about just transition? How do we make sure that this is, you know, done in a fair way and um, consider that nature, you know, starting to realize we can't have the transition without, you know, functioning ecosystems, biodiversity. And then the, my sort of background comes from, from the resilience and adaptation side. And, you know, there is a growing recognition that we won't, will not achieve net zero if we don't address already the changing climate. So that makes it, all three put a lot of pressure on the quality of the transition. And I think that's where, you know, where we also need to be realistic that, that a lot of companies need, need help. And maybe the one point, um, just last week I was talking to, um, you know, medium-sized companies and the number one issue that came up was skills. They said, we just do not have enough people internally to help us deliver on this. And, you know, you would say, wow, that's a great story, you know, great green jobs. Well, but these companies operate under a lot of pressure and for them to go out and just hire, you know, is sometimes re really difficult or where are these skilled people and you know looking at my LSE job you know after that meeting I went back to the LSE and I said skills what what are we doing you know how, how many courses are we offering but it's obviously not not that simple and um, and then the last point I know there's a lot of focus on data analytics and well I've been doing you know work in this space and, and Rowan and I we've been sort of challenging the industry on getting better with data analytics. And I think this is really important. But what is equally important is the sort of governance, corporate governance around the analytics. And um, I'll just leave you with another stat, unfortunately also not a very good one. Um, we've done some work in the US and only 15% of boards of, of corporates across different sectors had some form of oversight over the climate <laughs> analytics that the companies were engaged in. So, you know, only 15%. Well, I think that under that there are lots of, of challenges, but the key thing is, and that's something that, that we as at Marsh McLennan really try to bring home, you need to internalize this. You know, corporate governance need to embrace this, and it's not something that you can outsource. And you know, climate analytics wouldn't it be great if I just get you know the right metrics from someone and then just put them into my equation and job done? Well, that that's not how it works, and that's what makes it so so difficult. So, you know, the the corporate side, corporate risk governance is 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 really important in this. Yeah, thanks. There's so much in there about providing support and, and reassurance and 
I, I suppose ultimately these boards will have to be comfortable with the transition plan that is, that is produced. So having more oversight over the, the methodologies and, and being more comfortable with the data. Um, Tim, if we can come to you now for the sort of policy regulatory side of all of this. Um, what are the, the, I suppose, the regulatory use cases of transition plans and, and how is the Bank of England considering this? So, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, lovely to be here. I think in, it's very useful to sort of the, the flow of the, the agenda so far because Baroness Penn very neatly set out the, um, the UK's Green Finance Strategy, which was set up um, not just sort of the role of transition plans, but sort of also wider disclosure as well. Um, uh, and Jen's already done half my job for me by talking about the uh, one use case. Um, uh, but when I'm talking about sort of our perspective as a regulator, what I really wanted to do was sort of try and illuminate that with two use cases. So the first was finance, financial institutions uh, as users of transition plans, as, as Jen has already spoken to. Um, so using uh, those are corporates, but also counterparties um, for their own purposes. Second is the um, regulators' use of financial institutions' transition plans. Both, I think, are, are core uh, and key to sort of our wider objectives as well. Um, so on the first, about financial institutions as users of transition plans, um, I think it's, uh, we've touched on it several times today, but sort of transition planning and transition plans are a key part of the transition finance um, framework of how we sort of get from where we are today to sort of mobilizing capital, having efficient allocation of capital to sort of drive um, transition forward. Um, from a regulator's perspective, I'm, I'm concerned with sort of the, the elements around ensuring the resilience of the financial system uh, to the impacts of climate change, as well as enabling it to sort of uh, try and finance that transition while sort of still being resilient to all of those, those outcomes. And one of the lessons we took from the scenario exercise, the CBES, um, uh, that we ran uh, uh, last year and published the results on, was that overall costs um, will be lowest and the opportunities greatest from an orderly, orderly transition. And I really think that speaks to sort of the need of transition finance frameworks and sort of mobilising capital. And while designers' transition plans provide this forward-looking information, which Jen has already spoken about, um, on how customers and clients and counterparties are starting to address climate, where are they going, what's their strategy, what are their financing needs, but also importantly, how are they managing risks? That forward-looking um, information can then sort of then be internalised, uh, as Jen has also said, on, on set strategy setting, but for us, importantly, it also feeds into effective risk management. Um, it reduces the uncertainty about what their customers and clients are doing um, in the future, where they're going, but also provides more detailed information sort of reflected back in, into effective risk management. Second use case, uh, regulators use of transition plans. Um, so one of the things we look at as a supervisor uh, and as a regulator is how are the financial institutions we look at, what's their strategy, their organisational strategy. It's a core component, including a core component of the Bank of England's own um, supervisory expectations for, for banks and insurers in the UK, in terms of understanding that strategy, to then understand the risks associated with that strategy, to then play that through to whether the risk management framework is commensurate with those risks. So for us, as a user of that information, it also to helps us understand um, where, where, that, where the financial firms are going. So what does that indicate for transition plans then more, more generally? Um, for me, it really speaks to the thing, one of the things we've already touched on really, which is there are going to be many users of transition plans. There's shareholders, there's financiers and investors, there's regulators, um, as well as understanding sort of just the, the general trajectory of the transition as well. Um, and so one of the ways in which I think about this conversation is thinking about transition planning and transition plans as through the lens of one plan, but multiple users. I think that goes to the core of sort of designing, for example, the TPT framework, but when we think about the, the wider implementation of it as well. Um, uh, and I think that that is crucial because a transition plan should be integrated and reflected in an organization's wider strategy. It's not a separate strategy. It speaks to the core of the strategy. It's just a reflection of the transition component. Um, so we, should, we wouldn't want to see multiple plans, um, but we should design the framework so that the strategy is reflected and, and usable by, by other firms. But also that approach also then helps to maximize the benefits in a proportionate way from, from the production and sort of development of these plans we talk, talked about um, they do take investment, they, they take time, 
uh, speaking uh, with a different part of my hat on in terms of developing the Bank of England's own plan for our physical operations, we committed to do that last year. Sort of, we're thinking about the policy side of this, but we also know firsthand some of the challenges and lessons that are learned in actually developing that, that plan ourselves. Um, so in summary, um, we're continuing to support sort of Transition Plan Task Force, engaging with the, with the government through the green finance strategy, reflecting on our role as supervisors and what our use case is uh, without creating any, any fragmentation. Um, but we sort of then need to ensure and encouraging this approach of firstly, whole economy transition as well, I think is key as, as Matt's already pointed out, but also multiple users, but a single plan. Um, uh, and that is a way to sort of maximizing this, this cost benefit of, of developing these plans. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, I think we're, we're really hearing a, a call for action about you know, resourcing your teams to make sure that, the, that organizations are, are able to put these complex plans together. Um, Matt, you've spoken a little bit about the strategic and rounded approach, and, and perhaps we can pull out a piece around engagement. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, Tim, you, you alluded to some of this too. Um, can you speak about why engagement is important and how we might expect to see that in the transition plan? Yeah, sure. And I think we're probably all familiar with the sort of engagement versus divestment debates that happen. I think just to put it in context, the, the TPT has five different pillars in terms of what it's looking for firms to disclose. So firstly, foundations, um, then implementation strategy, engagement strategy, metrics and targets, and then governance. So engagement is one of the, the five main pillars of the TPT framework. It's probably worth also mentioning that we have been working really closely hand in glove with, with GFANS. So actually the, the framework that we're putting forward, you'll see is also reflected in the work that GFANS is doing. Um, and I think it's part, of, again, of this transition in thinking, if you like, around the focus on an economy-wide transition. And what can the financial sector do with the levers and capabilities it has to make a difference and accelerate the transition in the real economy? Um, and similarly, I think uh, for those close to GFANS, you may see a similar sort of transition in thinking happen a little bit in what GFANS is recommend recommending as well, this sort of focus beyond just reducing financed emissions to really reducing emission reductions in the real economy. And engagement we would see as one of the tools that the financial sector has to, to help steward that whole economy transition. I think in the TPT framework, we talk about engagement with governments, we talk about engagement with other industry players, engagement with customers, consumers. Um, and obviously that's, that's something that the whole economy can do, whatever sector that you're in, to, to help engage and encourage the behaviours that we need to, to get to a whole economy transition. So I think, again, the, um, it's really just acknowledging this, this, the need to think through you know, what the financial sector can do to really make a difference to, to the future risks that we face that are coming from global emissions, not just portfolio emissions. Um, and I think it's fair to acknowledge that this is a, it's a frontier area, isn't it? That, you know, this whole idea that we've never really had to collectively manage a future risk by taking action today. Uh, and it's quite hard to know what is going to make a difference. Um, and I just perhaps point to, before I finish, some of the great work that's happening. Maybe some people here are, are involved with it. I see Joe down there in terms of the Climate Financial Risk Forum, building out a set of metrics that covers these use cases. Uh, including metrics for mobilising finance into climate solutions and some really helpful work that's been done around engagement. Obviously, it's hard to necessarily attribute the impact you might be having, but there's some interesting thinking that is developing and I think is an area of, of key research that we all need to continue to, uh, to explore this idea of climate stewardship. Grand. Thank you, Matt. Um, Jen, can we explore a little bit how, how Barclays goes about this? and perhaps particularly with governments and, and policy makers? Yeah, of course. So, as Matt was saying, there's sort of the three areas within the TPT framework where it asks you to set out what you're doing on engagement. On the client side, I've already touched on a little bit that we want to factor in these sort of assessments that we do through that, but, but engagement really with clients is sort of the best way that a bank can support the transition rather than, as Matt was saying, sort of the divestment argument, but sort of being there with our clients as they transition is really the best way we can help promote it. And that is particularly true for those high carbon sectors. We obviously talk to clients all the time. We already engage with them, but on specific climate measures, 
factoring in things like the assessments we make will allow us to really prioritise where to focus our engagement, largely on those that seem most at risk of sort of falling behind in the transition, and really develop the sort of the products, the services, the education that they need to help them sort of get back on track and sort of develop the skills internally that they need. Because that's the best way that we're going to have a whole economy transition is by bringing every company along the way with us. On the sort of industry side, I mean, there are probably four or five pages in our annual report that set out all the different industry groups that we're a member of. These are immensely helpful <laughs> to everybody that's trying to figure out all these very thorny issues in what is effectively still sort of uncharted territory. And, you know, I personally stood on a number of them. Uh, the Banking for Impact on Climate and Action sets out agriculture target setting guidance last year. That was incredibly helpful to get sort of banks together to figure out how to do this. It's, it's definitely a fundamental part of sort of broader engagement outside of clients. And then focusing, as you asked Jack, on the sort of public policy government side of things, this is definitely a, a fundamental part as well because we are so aware that we can't factor, we can't as a financial sector, and certainly not as an individual bank, drive the transition on our own. And the transition in a number of sectors in particular is really fundamentally reliant on sort of government and public policy. A key one of those sectors is sort of residential real estate, where some sort of retrofitting policy that is. So we are so reliant on sort of governments to act there, and we will do our part. But you know, there's always so many different actors that need to be involved in that. And so, sort of engaging with public policy is therefore something we see as our responsibility to make sure that we're sort of supportive of those public policy um, actions that we need. And in particular, those real economy pathways are something that are so useful for a financial sector institution as we develop our approach. And Baroness Penn touched on it earlier that you know, they set out some of these roadmaps for really key sectors in clean tech, but the more of those real economy sector pathways that we have, the better we can align our uh, transition, transition strategy sort of uh, to that and sort of promote it as smoothly as possible. Engagement with government and public policy takes a number of different formats. There's the typical sort of responding to consultations that, that we do um, quite rigorously and we publish all of our consultation responses on our website. There's also participating in working groups with the TPT being a really key example here and Barclays sits on, we were participating in the sandbox, we sit on a number of the working groups because we really want to help provide our expertise and help shape the agenda for that, not just for the framework that we're going to be disclosing against but also the framework that our clients will be disclosing against in those real economy sectors because that's the way we can make sure that the data that we want that I spoke to earlier is coming out um, from our clients as well. And then also there's sort of indirect policy engagement that happens through the trade associations that we're a member of. And this is equally as important. Um, obviously they represent, these trade associations represent a big group of actors. And what is important is, as the TBT says, is to make sure that those trades are representing the views of its members um, in a way that is sort of aligned with net zero. And so we uh, started a piece of work last year where we tried to look at our most material trade associations and see, you know, is their climate policy position aligned with net zero and aligned with, therefore, our aims as a bank. And what we found is they, they don't have a climate policy position very often, so that's quite a challenge. Um, so definitely something that's more of a focus for this year, and we want to make sure that it's, it's sort of our whole spectrum engagement is pushing in the right direction. And then sort of to bring it back to the TPT framework, what's really key is just to set this all out transparently. So as I said, we publish our consultation responses on our website. Uh, we try and be clear and transparent about the other working groups and the other areas that we're engaging as well. And as we're doing this sort of trade association review and going into more depth than that, we hope to be able to set out more information on that as well. So it's really <coughs> fundamental to cover sort of the spectrum of your engagement, but then also be really clear and really transparent so that people reading your transition plan can determine whether or not you're covering that uh, spectrum and really pushing across the board uh, and getting that real economy strategic and rounded approach that Matt pointed out earlier. Brilliant, thank you both. Um, so totally fundamental to a successful transition plan. Um, we, we've spoken quite a bit about climate and I suppose we focused perhaps on, on net zero as part of that. Um, moving a little bit to sort of wider topics, the TPT has set up working groups on nature, on adaptation, and on the just transition. 
And um, when we started the whole TPT process over a year ago, they felt a little bit othered. But I think what's true to say is over the past year, we've just seen a real push for the inclusion of, of that and, the, and full integration, which has come from many stakeholders um, in quite a significant consultation. Um, so it does feel like the, the agenda is changing a little bit there. Um, Svenja, you're a member of the CCC's Adaptation Committee. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the relationship between a transition plan and adaptation? Yeah, I'm very happy to. So the CCC, the Committee on Climate Change, is a statutory body and basically we have two, two main jobs is to sort of hold, hold the country or the government accountable um, in terms of achieving net zero, but also adapting to climate change and making sure that we have a well adapted UK. Um, and I think, you know, for, you know, since its inception, we've been sort of treating this relatively separate, but I think this is starting to change. Um, with the simple reason that the climate is already changing and we, we are already experiencing climate impacts and that is having an impact on transition strategies. <coughs> And I just give give you an example. So, heat waves, you know, they, they are really challenging and, and difficult for, for energy systems. Um, we've seen this last year. Um, we also see this with, with buildings. So there is a huge effort to decarbonize our built environment. At the same time, our built environment is also exposed to increased flood risk. And you know, if, if your building has been flooded it usually requires more than half a year of, um, you know, sort of dehumidifying and, and drying out. And that is hugely energy intensive. And, you know, that can easily, if you are a, the business that, that sort of runs this, is affected by this, your transition strategy can actually be derailed by climate impacts. I mean, that's, that's really the reason why we have to look at this, you know, both it, t together. And the CCC is actually, um, just in March, um, we published a report that looked at the UK's um, power system, power, power generation capacity and you know, the infrastructure. And for the first time, we looked at it both on the net zero side and also climate resilience side. And we sort of mapped out what it would take to, to achieve, you know, sort of a low carbon energy, secure energy system that is also resilient, that can cope with shocks and that, you know, doesn't, doesn't come to a halt when there is a, a, an extreme event and that can cope with, with heat. And I think that's the kind of mindset um, that is really, really important. And so I'm, I was very pleased when the um, TPT sort of um, announced that there would be this adaptation working group. I'm a member of it. Um, and it's, you know, it's been an interesting exercise because I think there is obviously the danger that you know, you, that every transition plan then also be, has a sort of subset adaptation plan. And I don't think that's really the idea. The idea is that you demonstrate that you've thought about, you know, how resilient your transition is and where the exposures are and how, how you actually cope if there is um, an extreme event or if, if the temperatures are getting up. You know, how is your transition plan going to deal with that? And similarly on the nature side, you know, how is your transition plan incorporating nature? So I think this whole mindset of having an integrated view should not really lead, you know, overcomplicate things. I think it should make this actually more practical and more real. I think that's the ambition. I, I certainly hope that that's the outcome. Doing this work, sometimes it feels it is actually really complex. So I hope we can sort of tone down the, the complexity and, and make this workable because ultimately, you know, um, people will have to deliver this. Small companies, large companies, organizations will, will have to work with this. And it shouldn't be, you know, it shouldn't be too much of a burden, but it should really encourage also then their, their own decision making. So, um, yeah, it's... It's an important area, but we have to keep in mind, you know, the transition is difficult, but doing it while the climate is already changing, you know, is even harder. Very hard, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tim, can we come a little bit to, to maybe your perspectives on, on interest in the resilience of, of, of plans in that particular point? Yeah, I, I think that last point is really crucial. It's the, 
even if we align to a 1.5 world, that doesn't mean that we don't also need to adapt. We need to transition, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but also adapt to the world we're going to be in. As a regulator, we're, we're interested in financial risk. Um, and so transition to a 1.5 world or whatever the climate outcome is, um, entails transition risk, but we also need to be conscious of the adaptation risk. And what, that's what we're, we're, centrally, we're centrally focused on. Um, so I think sort of thinking about a firm strategy on the road to transition reflected in their transition planning, but also adapting as they need to go and thinking about these interplays is important. Uh, and we're, we're closely following sort of the, the work of the TPT um, on thinking, th thinking through some of these issues. If I, if I maybe could just sort of use that and sort of tie it to the conversation that we've just had on, on engagement as well, because I do think the engagement pillar of transition planning is crucial, particularly in, in the short term as well. Um, in order to mitigate the long-run impacts of, of climate change, uh, we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions mean, meaning reducing production of those emissions in the real economy. The financial sector has a, has a role to do that. Um, for financial sector, that means scope three. Scope three emissions is where, where the majority of uh, financial sector's firms are going to be. So that means your financed emissions, your emissions are going to be coming from who you finance, but also your supply chain. And so this engagement point to understand sort of transition, but also adaptation needs is also really crucial in terms of understanding what that means for a firm's own transition strategy, um, helping a whole of economy transition, helping to inform adaptation. Um, but also we've talked about data and skills as well. In the short term, well, data sets and data frameworks are still being developed and we're trying to unlock that data question. That engagement is really crucial to sort of feed that, that information early in the process, but also really crucial for sort of skills in terms of larger firms supporting and engaging with their supply chain, um, which means, enables, and particularly for large and small firms working together collaboratively, I think it's really crucial in sort of helping to sort of uh, both firms collectively to sort of meet their own emissions because I think that's crucial in terms of as we go down but also particularly in the, in the near term so I think it sort of it tries it needs to knit all together as one we can't we need to think about these separate in order to sort of think about the issues but ultimately they all still need to come together at some point. Yeah thanks Tim um, and really important points on, on SMEs too and yeah. um, we heard from the minister this morning about the government's own work in supporting data generation in SMEs, and, and that's going to be so crucial. Um, we are going to have time for a couple of audience questions, and then we will try to get you to, to a coffee break. Um, just before we do, just a final a word, Jen, on the, the nature element um, and Barclay's work uh, so far. Could you say a couple of points on that, and then we'll come to audience for questions. Yeah, sure, and um, I will caveat everything I'm about to say by the fact that I clearly have climate in my territory, not nature, but it is definitely increasingly untenable to think about climate without thinking about nature as well. I'm seeing that more and more literally every day in my inbox. Um, but what is clearly important in the context of climate and the context of climate transition plan is to think about the nature interdependencies that that transition will have and that is both from the risks to nature, from the way that the climate transition plan is implemented, but also identifying the opportunities for co-benefits, because that definitely can be the case. And if you take a considered approach, then it can be really a win-win situation. Um, things like the TNFD are definitely advancing our understanding in this area and providing the frameworks that don't currently exist in order to identify those risks and potential opportunities. Um, in particular, it's clearly relevant for some sectors rather more than others. Um, agriculture is the prime example here. You really cannot think about transitioning in the agriculture sector without considering nature. And actually, the way you go about it can really deliver those co-benefits, particularly when you think about its role in uh, carbon sequestration. Thinking about nature from the beginning of that conversation can allow you to do certain actions in a way that maybe you wouldn't have considered otherwise. And thing, this, for this reason, we at Barclays prioritised the food and ag sector when we conducted a TNFD pilot last year, uh, looking at the potential risks in that, se in that sector. And we are developing our nature strategy off the back of that, but also integrating those findings within our climate risk assessment as well. And I should say the two things are important and, and sort of separate activities, integrating within climate, but also taking an independent nature approach as well. 
Another sector that is a prime example of sort of needing a, an additional focus on nature is around sort of development of low carbon technology. Obviously, the demand for things like EVs, uh, sort of solar panels, all of that clean tech is going to ramp up um, over the coming years. And with that will be a ramp up in the demand for critical minerals and key materials that often have to be mined. And we are probably all aware of the potential negative uh, consequence on nature and biodiversity from the mining sector. If we think about those impacts from the beginning and we integrate it into decision making, then the driver to find alternative approaches or at least to take steps to minimise those risks will be a lot more present. And I think I read last week that the world's first dedicated solar panel recycling facility is only opening this month, which I think really drives home the need to think about these things from the beginning because re recycling should be a fundamental part of trying to minimise our demand and, uh, for those min critical materials and therefore minimise the impacts that mining can have. And I think that's really clear throughout the TPT's framework in terms of integrating these considerations throughout decision making, throughout your engagement, policies, targets, governments, everything. Uh, think about it at every step. And that's why we're really happy as Barclays to be representing on the TPT Nature Working Group and so we can sort of share our knowledge in this area as well. There's certainly a, a sort of l earlier stage um, development of frameworks in this area, so work coming from the TPT will be, will be really fundamental. And I think my sort of key takeaway, as I said briefly at the beginning, is thinking about nature as its own separate entity. And I have colleagues with nature in their title that are doing just that, but people like me thinking about nature within the context of climate change and for the transition planning side of things, how does your transition plan impact on and depend upon nature is, is really a crucial part of it. Great, thank you. Yeah, just because nature and just transition and adaptation aren't in your job title doesn't mean it's not integral. Right, a couple of questions. Um, one down the front here and then one in the middle row. Is there a mic or something like that? There is a mic. Uh, Mike Clark. So my question to the panel is, how familiar are the panel with what's going on in the UK pension sector. And to give context to that and lead to a rather sharp question for Tim, I'd like to pick up Sven's really good echo chamber point. At one end of the UK pension sector, the pension funds publishing what can only be called nonsense. At four degrees, the expected return on a pension fund is 70 basis, less, 70 basis points less than it would be. At the other end, there are leaders who have dismissed CBEST scenarios as not decision useful and pension funds get to this quicker than banks and insurers and that title is probably quite polite. So they have dismissed the official scenarios, they are using a different approach and trying to approach the real world. I think you nearly said tipping points, you didn't say tipping points, but we could get a tipping point pretty soon. So the question is, how familiar are the panel with the UK pension sector progress and when will the Bank of England tip and take a leadership position that in fact we need to have more uncertainty, more asset prices, more volatility in your leadership role? Thank you. Thanks. So would any panellists like to take initial views on the pension sector? One for, I think one for Tim maybe. Yeah, so I, think, I think the question came to me, <laughs> so, so maybe I'll tackle it. Um, is the Bank of England, but we're not the pensions regulator. So I'll, I'll, I'll frame this through through the lens of financial stability. Um, as I've already said, one of the key things we're looking at is resilience to the financial system, not just from transition to net zero, but of all with climate outcome and, and facilitating the transition to net zero. You mentioned CBERS. I think it's, and I'm, kind of, I'm not going to front run, there's a panel on, on scenario analysis and stress testing, which is where do we go next? So I'm not, I'm not going to front run any, any of that um, conversation because I think it'll be a really interesting panel. There's much more time to sort of get into the details there. But I, I will say on CBEZ, it was a learning exercise. CBEZ wasn't designed to stress the financial system. It was designed to understand the future, the impacts of different potential climate outcomes from a early orderly transition through to a no transition on today's business models. And it was about trying to understand and deepen our understanding of how those impacts could th play through business models rather than necessarily stressing the system. We learned a lot, firms learned a lot, 
the capabilities of, of really driving home. I think there are questions about where does this, question, the, this debate evolve from here, but I think as a starting point, as a learning exercise, I think that we, 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 we did and have learned a lot from just having run that exercise. I think that will inform sort of where we, get, where we go from here. I think, but understanding what CBEZ was designed to do and what it told us and what it didn't tell us because it, because it wasn't designed to do that, I think is also really crucial um, as we sort of continue to, to evolve our approach. Great, thanks Tim, and a good segue to the next section. Um, question in the middle here. Hello, this is a question for, for Jennifer and a side question for Tim. So, uh, very interesting uh, your description of what Barclays is doing. So, you describe uh, the client approach as you bucket clients into five buckets uh, depending on how you think their transition plan is going. And then you mentioned something about capital allocation. So. Can you uh, say a little bit more about how these buckets translate into allocation? For example, are you putting constraints on allocation to buckets or something of the sort? Uh, I'm curious to know how these transition plans uh, translate into actual, you know, actionable uh, um, parts of the, of the management. And a question related to this for Tim is, uh, how does the Bank of England as a supervisor hold banks accountable to the transition plans? Is it at the very consultative stage, or are they actually being held accountable uh, uh, in the near future as to what they will actually do during the transition with respect to what they declared uh, at the onset? Sure, I can uh, kick off on that. So, as I mentioned, last year was the first year that we rolled out this assessment approach, and so we, much like with the CBEZ, learned a lot <laughs> through that year of how the best approach to do this is, what the right things to look for are, how much we can actually get from firm's disclosures. We had developed this framework over the year and then we engaged Oliver Wyman to do a sort of full um, in-depth review of our assessment framework to see if it was up to scratch. We integrated their findings into it and we've updated it sort of a 2.0 version that we're then running again this year. So because of that, we have not yet taken the steps to integrate into things like capital allocation, but we have our sights set on that as we develop this framework and refine it and disclosures get better so our results can get more robust and accurate. Capital allocation is, is one of those areas. Also, there's going to be things like how we engage, as I said before, prioritising where we focus our efforts on climate engagement. Also, things like scenario analysis. Can we factor these results in where we say, if you're a really poorly rated firm in our framework, maybe in scenario analysis we, we take the assumption that you won't transition, or different risk indicators in that sense. And there are so many use cases for these ratings, and that's why we've taken the time to really develop and refine the, the framework as much as we can before rolling it out in more detail. And another thing we really hope to do is use it eventually to demonstrate how we're trying to support real economy decarbonisation. In our disclosures, if we can show that you know, our, our clients are improving their scores over time as they develop much more robust approaches to the transition, more ambitious targets, and more aligned with net zero pathways and scenarios, that can hopefully show and demonstrate how we're supporting our clients as they transition, rather than just sort of making financial uh, sort of portfolio adjustments and, and doing sort of paper decarbonisation that's already been referenced. And then perhaps very briefly, I'll try and answer your question. I think it comes back to use cases for, for transition plans. Jen's talked about a financial institutions use case. When it comes to a supervisor's use case, it comes back to this point about understanding a firm's strategy and therefore their risk appetite and their risk management framework. And the core of our, of our work as a supervisor on, on climate lies in our supervisory expectations of, of, uh, for climate change. Um, one of the first core elements of that is around governance, and within that, it's uh, does the board have a strategy around climate change under, and an understanding of the short, near, and uh, short, medium, and long term consequences of that. And inherently, that's also at the core of, of, a, of a transition plan. It's talking about a firm's strategy of how they are going to approach and manage the transition um, and sort of transform their own organisation to, to, towards, um, uh, uh, hopefully, a, a 1.5 or net zero world. And then it also speaks to the role that we play as supervisors. We're concerned with ensuring resilience to the system, ensuring firms are managing financial risks. 
Um, and subject to that is sort of supporting government on, on, uh, on, the, on transition. But it's really for sort of the government uh, through its climate policy, as Brian's Penn's always set out today, through the green finance strategy to sort of drive that transition and then also on firms um, for themselves and the actions of individuals to sort of, um, sort of respond to that as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Tim. Um, I think we're going to have to close there just because we're a bit behind on time. But please join me in thanking the panellists.